open with prayer. Father, we come before you again by the precious blood of the Lamb. We thank you for another day of walking in covenant with you. Thank you for this, your holy Shabbat, that we can come together as your people Israel, natural branches and grafted in, but one in Messiah Yeshua. Father, we just ask that you'd open the eyes of our understanding today, that you would enlighten us to the hope of your calling as we study your Torah, as we study your word, and we give you the praise, honor, and glory for it. B'shem Yeshua Mashiachenu, in the name of Yeshua our Messiah, we pray. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. All right, Shemini is our Torah portion today. It means eighth. And it's Leviticus chapter 9, starting at verse 1 through chapter 11. And we'll start reading at 9 1, then we'll skip to verse 23. It came to pass on the eighth day, and that's where that word comes from, from the portion, that Moses called Aharon and his sons and the elders of Israel. Verse 23, And Moshe and Aharon went into the tabernacle of meeting and came out and blessed the people. Then the glory of Yahweh appeared to all the people, and fire came down from before Yahweh and consumed the burnt offering and the fat on the altar. When the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. Miracles happen in Yahweh's presence. I mean, fire came out and consumed them. But then again in the Torah portion, fire came out at another time, and not all the miracles are necessarily good. Leviticus 10.1, Aharon's sons and Adav and Avihu each took his censer, put fire in it, and incense on the fire, and presented unauthorized fire, strange fire, another translation says, before Yahweh, which was not in accordance with his orders. At this, a flame leapt out from Yahweh's presence and swallowed them up, and they perished before Yahweh. When we come into Yahweh's presence, we want to make sure that we're doing things according to his instructions, that we are clean. We see it again in the New Testament. I didn't actually put it down this time, but when Ananias and Sapphira came at the outpouring of the Holy Spirit a little bit afterwards, they came and, and said that they were bringing all their money that they, from this property they sold, but they held some of it back, and they actually lied. They were lying to the Holy Spirit. They dropped dead. Same thing. It's very, very important that we walk according to his instructions, that we're doing it with a pure heart, with the right motivation. We want to see his power. We want to see his fire. We don't want it to consume us, though. So that's the thing. In the beginning, Genesis 126 says, And God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And then chapter 2, 7 from Genesis, Yahweh shaped man from the soil of the ground and blew the breath of life into his nostrils, and man became a living being. The breath of Yahweh gave man life. He created us in his image and likeness from the very beginning for fellowship. And because of Adam's sin, sin came onto all mankind and all sin, we spiritually died. We have to have new life in order to be with Yahweh again. So Yahweh recreated us in His Son Yeshua and made us part of His body. And we see this in John 20, verse 21. So Yeshua said to them, Peace be to you, Shalom Aleichem. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when He had said this, He breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. The breath of Yah again. So this time the breath made new life in mankind. The very presence of Yahweh himself came into man. And Yeshua, man became a new creation, a new creature. 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us, Therefore, if anyone is in Messiah, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Yeshua Messiah and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Messiah, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. We're to take this word, this good news, to the world. We've got a commission to teach this reconciliation to the world. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You'll read that in Romans. I mean, you've already read it, and you'll memorize it eventually. 
The Romans road is what a lot of people use to lead people to the Lord. Because the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Messiah Yeshua. But when we become new creations, new creatures, there's supposed to be some signs, some supernatural things that follow. And Yeshua tells us about it in Mark 16, 15. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. This is something Yeshua said will happen to those that believe. In John 14, 10, he says, Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. So the Father dwelling in us is what's going to do the works. <clears throat> Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. He said it again. We're supposed to be doing the works that Yeshua did. Now, how are we supposed to do this? What, what gives us this ability? John 14, 13, he goes on and tells us, And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. But then there's qualifications, and he goes on, he says, If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you a little while longer, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. And at that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him by this comfort by the Holy Spirit that he's going to be bringing. He's going to manifest himself to us. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Yeshua answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives do I give it to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You have heard me say to you that I am going away and coming back to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said I'm going to the Father. For my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming and he has nothing in me. But that the world may know that I love the Father. And as the Father gave me commandment, so I do. Arise, let us go from here. So he's going to give us the Holy Spirit. And he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. So part of it is walking in obedience. And then the very presence of the Father himself is going to come in by his Holy Spirit. Now there's going to be a timing when the Holy Spirit was going to be poured out. John 7, 38. He says, who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit whom those believing in him would, not, would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Yeshua was not yet glorified. Well, he has been glorified. When he rose from the dead, he was glorified. Now, this manifestation of the Spirit is supposed to be flowing out as rivers of living water. Rivers are for blessing others. It's not just to heap upon ourselves. It's for blessing others specifically. 
Now, why aren't we seeing these signs, these rivers of Holy Spirit power flowing today? Well, Luke eleven thirteen, 13, he says, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? He wants us to ask Him for it. It doesn't happen automatically. So are we really seriously asking for His Holy Spirit and for His power, the power that the Holy Spirit, these rivers of living water, have we asked Him for that? He wants us to have these signs following, so we need to ask Him. Now in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, Paul is sharing with us. He says, And God has appointed these in the assembly. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. Are all apostles? Obviously not. Are all prophets? Obviously not. Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healings? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the best gifts. Are we earnestly desiring the best gifts? That's the thing. We have to read and study and even see what the gifts are. And then we have to desire them. We have to be seeking Him to give us these things. But it's not to heap it on ourselves. Again, it's to bless others, to bring people into the kingdom. That's the purpose of the anointing, of these rivers of living water that He wants to flow out from us. So the gifts don't always happen automatically. Sometimes in Scripture we can see that they did, but, but most of the times it wasn't automatic. You have to first ask and then earnestly desire to be used in this way to bring people to Yeshua. That's the key. It's bringing people into the kingdom, being a laborer to help bring in the harvest. Now look at Acts chapter 4, verse 18. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Yeshua. This was after Peter and John healed the, the guy that had been sitting by the temple, the gate beautiful, for all those years. And then, then he was healed, and then the Sanhedrin took him before him and commanded him not to speak in the name of Yeshua. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard got to be a fire shut up within us we've got to speak it with such passion sharing this witness this good news because the presence of the living God is dwelling within us we've got to meditate on these things it's got to be alive in us so when they had further threatened them they let them go finding no way of punishing them because of the people since they all glorified God for what had been done for the man was over 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed and being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord. That unity is important, too. And said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant David have said, Why did the heathens rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against Yahweh and against his Messiah. For truly against your holy servant Yeshua, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, and the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Yeshua. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. That's the reason for this anointing, sharing the good news. The result of being filled with the Holy Spirit was that the believers spoke the word of God with boldness. Are we ready to do the same? The Holy Spirit and His gifts were not given to us just to bless us as we sit in our services. I mean, it's wonderful feeling His presence when we worship Him. But there's a purpose for His anointing. The primary purpose of the gifts is to bring people into the kingdom. We have to be willing to go where the needs are. Very, very rarely was it that Yeshua would heal people in the synagogue. He would sometimes. But you don't really see that in any of the other 
with any of the other apostles or any of the other things in the book of Acts. It was always out where the people were. Look at Acts 8.1. Now Saul was consenting to his death. This was Stephen. At that time, a great persecution arose against the assembly, which is at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the entire of the assembly, entering every house, dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. They didn't run and hide. They went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria. Now, both Stephen and Philip were just part of the seven men that were anointed as deacons to feed the people. They weren't like apostles or anybody special. They were men full of the Spirit, though. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Messiah to them. And the multitudes, with one accord, heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed. And many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. This was an ordinary man that was seeking, desiring earnestly the best gifts. And the Father used him. The Father filled him. When he went to where the needs were, that's when the miracles happened. In Acts 5.12, And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were all of them with one accord in Solomon's porch. Yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on the beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Also a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities in Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Again, the great healings took place in the streets, not in the synagogues. When the presence of God is in our midst, there's power. We can expect the power, but we've got to be willing to go where that power is supposed to be used, where the people need it. Acts 14, 8. And in Lystra, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, a crippled from his mother's womb, who had never walked. This man heard Peter's, or Paul speaking. Paul observing him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand up straight on your feet. And he leaped and he walked. Again, Paul was out where the needs were. And this is where the miracles happened. We don't see them in our churches because that's not where they happened in Scripture. They're not supposed to necessarily. <laughs> miracles are for people that are in desperate need. They don't understand how to walk by faith. They're used to attract people to come into relationship with Yahweh. Acts 28.1. Now when they had escaped, they then found out that the island was called Malta. This was after Paul was shipwrecked. And the natives showed us unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and made us all welcome because of the rain that was falling and because of the cold. But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. So when the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he has escaped the sea, yet justice does not allow to live. But he shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. However, they were expecting when he would swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But after they'd looked for a long time and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said he was a god. In that region there was an estate of the leading citizen on the island, whose name was Publius, who received us and entertained us courteously for three days. And it happened that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and dysentery. Paul went in to him and prayed, and laid his hands on him and healed him. So when this was done, the rest of the, those on the island who had diseases also came and were healed. They also honored us in many ways, and when we departed, they provided all, such things as were necessary. So again... The miracles happened where the people had the need. It wasn't in the church service. When Paul was out, even though he's just being taken to Rome, he was taking his presence with him. And he was constantly preaching the word. And that was the thing, the early believers, when the place was shaken and we were all filled with the Holy Spirit, was to confirm the word with signs following. We can expect these signs when we're out taking the word. 
Now, this is also an example of taking up serpents, like what Yeshua talked about. It's not like those nutty guys that actually go and get rattlesnakes and pick them up and do all this crazy stuff with them. You're not supposed to tempt the Lord your God. That was one of the things Yeshua showed us when he was being tempted by the enemy. But if a snake happens to bite you because of the Holy Spirit, he just shook it off into the fire and wasn't hurt. He said we can drink deadly things and it won't hurt us. We don't do it on purpose, but if accidentally we do these things, his presence within us will preserve us. Now what about healing in our own personal lives? How can we be healed if we don't normally see miracles in the congregation? My wife and I have seen all kinds of healings in our family, but none of them have been miraculous necessarily. I mean, they're all miraculous, but not instantaneous. Let me put it that way. The Father's prepared us. He's, he's given us scripture to meditate on. And he's had us build our faith by meditating on his word. And then when the need arose, we were ready and we could pray and ask in faith. And he, he worked his healing. Now, Deuteronomy 7, 12, it says, Then it shall come to pass, because you listen to these judgments, and keep and do them, that Yahweh your God will keep you with the covenant and with the mercy which he swore to your fathers. And he will love you and bless you and multiply you. He will also bless the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your land, your grain, your new wine, your oil, the increase of your cattle, the offspring of your flocks, in the land which he swore to your fathers to give you. You shall be blessed above all people. And there shall not be a male or a female barren among you or among your livestock. And Yahweh will take away from you all sickness and will afflict you with none of the terrible diseases of Egypt, which you have known, but will lay them on all those that hate you. <coughs> Because we walk in obedience to his Torah. Again, if we do our part, he is going to be faithful to do his part. But we still have to do our part. That's the key, because we tie his hands if we don't. If we're walking in disobedience to his word, he can't do anything, because we've tied his hands. Now, Yahweh's full blessing on his people is in the land of Israel, like we just read. And we'll see that full blessing when we return to the land in his timing. But healing is one of the blessings that we can benefit from now, no matter where we're at if we keep his commandments. Exodus 15, 26. If you listen carefully to the voice of Yahweh your God and do what he regards as right, if you pay attention to his commandments and keep all his laws, I shall never inflict on you any of the diseases that I inflicted on the Egyptians, for I am Yahweh, your healer. <laughs> Yahweh Rapha. He is our healer. And obedience is what allows him to work his healing in our bodies. Now, we see that it was the angel of Yahweh that spoke to Moses at Mount Sinai and gave him the Torah from Acts 7, 37. This is that Moses who said to the children of Israel, Yahweh your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear. This is he who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to give to us. So if we obey this angel... As Yahweh's representative, which it was Yeshua, we've done this study before, Yeshua was the angel of Yahweh. Yahweh said that he would take sickness and disease out of our midst. This is a promise. In Exodus 23, 20, he says, Look, I'm sending an angel to precede you, to guard you as you go, to bring you to the place that I have prepared. Revere him and obey what he says. Do not defy him. He will not forgive any wrongdoing on your part, for my name is in him. He won't put up with willful disobedience, is what he's saying. If, however, you obey what he says and do whatever I order, I shall be an enemy to your enemies and a foe to your foes. My angel will precede you and lead you to the home of the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, whom I shall exterminate. You will not bow down to their gods or worship them or observe their rites, but throw them down and smash their cultic stones. You will worship Yahweh your God, and then I will bless your food and water and keep you free from sickness. And why does he say food and water? Because food and water greatly affect our health. That's what we're learning as we watch these videos. But he'll bless us in our food and our water. He'll give us knowledge of witty inventions. He'll show us what's good to eat. And he'll keep us free of sickness. In your country, no woman will miscarry, none will be sterile, and I shall give you your full term of life. So part of the secret place of the Most High is protection from plagues and long life, he tells us in Psalms 91. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. 
I will say of Yahweh, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in him I will trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the pest, uh, perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and your buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flies by day, nor for the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor for the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. He's possibly talking about germ warfare and chemical warfare. We've never seen things like this in the past. This is a, a psalm that he's talking about for this present time, the end generation. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made Yahweh, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all their ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, or like Yeshua said in my name, you'll cast out demons. The young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Because he has set his love upon me. Therefore, I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him with long life. I will satisfy him and show him my salvation, my Yeshua. Now, David tells us that just as Yahweh forgives all of our iniquities, he also heals all of our diseases. There's not diseases that he can't heal. Not diseases that he won't heal. Psalms 103. Bless Yahweh, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless Yahweh, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities. Who heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from destruction. Who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. Who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. He'll bless our food and our water. He'll satisfy our mouth with good things. It's kind of funny because we had some instructions in our Torah portion this week about the good things that he wants to bless us with. And it has a lot to do with health and healing. Leviticus 11.43, Do not make yourselves detestable with all these swarming creatures. Do not defile yourselves with them. Do not be defiled by them. For it is I, Yahweh, who am your God. You have been sanctified and, I have become, and have become holy because I am holy. Do not defile yourself with all these creatures that swarm on the ground. Yes, it is I, Yahweh, who brought you out of Egypt to be your God. You must therefore be holy because I am holy. What we eat, what we put in our mouths and our bodies has to do with holiness because it's an act of worship if we obey his instructions and what he said is good to eat and what's not good to eat. And it can also do the opposite. It could be rebellion if we refuse to obey. And, and it's called sin. And as we're going to continue to see, sin is an open door for the enemy to put sickness and disease on us. Such is the law concerning animals, birds, all living creatures that move in the waters, and all creatures that swarm on the ground. Its purpose is to distinguish the clean from the unclean, the creatures that may be eaten from those that may not be eaten. So keeping our bodies clean and holy by following his instructions and eating what he says to eat and what not to eat plays a great role in our health and healing. Paying attention to not sowing your field with mixed seeds is another part. No GMOs. Don't, don't eat hybrids. These things will not promote health. The natural things that Yahweh made, those are the healthy things that we should be eating. Now Isaiah prophesied about a future price that was being paid for our healing in chapter 53. Verse 5, he says, but he was wounded for our transgressions, speaking of Yeshua. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. And again, this is conditional by us walking in obedience to his Torah and watching that we eat what he's told us is good to eat. Now, Peter makes it clear that it's in the past tense. The price for our healing has already been paid. 1 Peter 2.24, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. He's done it. He's paid that price. If we do our part in walking in obedience and eating properly, we can expect that healing to come on us just like he said it would.
He heals us of all our diseases. Now, John reveals that it's Yahweh's will that we prosper and be in health, just as our soul prospers. In 3 John, verse 2, he says, Beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. So our soul prospering has to do with our health as well. What we eat in our mouths and our physical bodies has to do with it. And also our soul, which is our mind, will, and our emotions, we're, we're a spirit being that possesses a soul, a consciousness, mind, will, and emotions that lives in a body. So even though we're born again, our souls still must be saved in order to prosper. In James 1.19, it says, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. His word is what saves our souls. Renewing our mind with his word is what will save our souls. Brainwashing ourselves. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We've got to make our souls prosper by renewing our minds with his word, by brainwashing ourselves the washing of the water of the word. And it's specifically his Torah, like he said in Joshua 1.8, this book of the Torah shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, then you'll have good success, then your bodies will be healed, then you'll be walking in his power as we continue to do all these things. The foundation is getting our minds renewed, getting our souls to prosper. Again, David gives us a second witness in Psalms 1. Blessed, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. We're not listening to ungodly things. Nor stands in the path of sinners. Nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the Torah of Yahweh. And in his Torah he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. It's the blessing of meditating in his Torah. As we do it by his spirit, as we're being led, that's where the power is, because his spirit was going to lead us into obedience. But his spirit is also the one that provides the power to do the miracles, to see people healed as we lay hands on them, to see demons cast out. Now, although we know it's Abba's will to heal us, there's a timing to Abba's manifesting his healing. It's interesting. We can see even, even missionaries, they can go out in the mission field and lay hands on people and see them recover and see these miracles that happen instantly to bring people into the kingdom. But when they themselves have problems, they have to stand in faith. That's what the Father wants us to do, just like Michael read, and I had it in here, but it, I had to cut some of it out because it was going to be way too long if I didn't. The just shall live by faith. He wants us as believers to live by faith, to expect that what he said in his word is going to happen and to do the things that we're supposed to do, and his healing will manifest. It might not be an instantaneous miracle like we'll see in the mission field, but it will happen if we do what he says. In Acts 3, 2, it says, A certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, who is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who would entered the temple who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, looked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, Look at us! So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold I don't have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Yeshua Messiah of Nazareth, rise up and walk! And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with him, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it was him who sat begging for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Now Yeshua walked by this man countless times. And Ava never healed him. Why did Peter do it? Because he was quickened by the Holy Spirit. He was sensitive to the Spirit of God inside of him. And it was the timing of Yahweh. We have to be led by His Spirit in these things. You can't just decide to do these on your own because it's His. It says the Spirit wills. We have to listen to His voice as we're going out 
preaching the word, taking the, the gospel to the world. When Abba's time was right, the healing was manifested. In John 5, 2, it says, Now there's in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is in Hebrew called Bethesda, having five porches. And these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. When Yeshua saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there in that condition a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Yeshua said to him, Rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well and took up his bed and walked. And that day was the Shabbat. The Jews therefore said to him who was cured, It's the Sabbath. It's not lawful for you to carry your bed. Not lawful according to who? According to the rabbis that had added all these extra rules. He answered them, He who made me well said to me, Take up your bed and walk. Then they asked him, Who's the man that said to you, Take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was, for Yeshua had withdrawn, a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Yeshua found him in the temple, and he said to him, See that you have made, uh, you've been made well. Sin no more lest a worse thing come upon you. Don't violate my Torah, because that will open a door for the enemy to put sickness back on you. Again, a worse thing, even. So it's obedience to his Torah that, that keeps us in that secret place, part of it. And he is very serious about not sinning, not eating the things he said not to eat, because when we do this, it, it's an open door for the enemy to come in and cause sickness and disease, and we won't be healed. Now, everybody at that pool had a covenant that included healing. Like David said, he'll heal all your diseases. And everybody was there to receive their healing. But Yeshua only went to the one man. It was only Abba's time for the one man. He was listening to the voice of his father. Now, there's always a reason for sickness. Sin or violating the Torah gives place for the enemy to inflict sickness, as we said. It removes us from that secret place of the Most High. It opens that hedge of protection and lets the enemy come in. So this man at the pool was told to go and sin no more, lest a worse thing or a worse sickness come upon him. We have to hear the spirit of Yahweh's instructions in each specific situation because we've seen a number of healings in our family, but every time there was different instructions. He didn't use the same instructions the whole, every time. There were different things we had to do. Situations were different. Now, prayer and fasting will allow us to hear Yahweh quickly. Sometimes we need to, to pray and we need to fast so that we can tune in to being able to hear the instructions he wants to give us. It's not that it's going to give us more power or anything like that. Yeshua cast out a devil that his disciples couldn't cast out at that particular time, and they said, well, why couldn't we cast him out? He says, this kind comes out only by prayer and fasting. It's not that you have more power through that. What it does is it makes you sensitive to be able to hear the instructions of the master so you can follow his instructions and then see that come to pass. Now, other things can affect our bodies as well. In Proverbs 17, 22, it says, A merry heart does good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. It's part of that renewing our soul with his word. It's part of meditating in his, his Torah day and night. We can have his joy, which is one of the fruits of his spirit. His joy is our strength, and it does good like a medicine. So our thought life can affect us greatly. In Philippians 4, 8, he says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true... Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there are any vir virtue, if there's to be any praise, think on these things. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace or shalom shall be with you. So we have to keep our thoughts stayed on Yahweh, on his Torah, listening for his voice to be led by his spirit. He has to be our motivation. Isaiah 26, 3 says, You will keep him in perfect peace, perfect shalom, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusts in you. Trust you in Yahweh forever. For in Yahweh is everlasting strength. 
His word is truth. He is faithful. If we do our part, he is going to do his part. Now, what comes out of our mouths will greatly affect our lives and the lives of those that we have influence over as well. In Proverbs 18, 21, it says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Now, in raising children, as parents, you have to be very careful what comes out of your mouth. You can't speak discouragement to your kids because it will affect them for their whole life. You need to encourage them in Yahweh. Let them know that you can do all things for the Messiah who strengthens you. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. You don't tell them they're stupid and that they'll never amount to anything. People that do that, just it, it's so hard on their children. It's just sad. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. It's a powerful thing. Now what comes out of our mouth reveals what's in our heart. In Luke 6.45 it says, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth that which is evil. For uh, from the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. Now again, what are we supposed to be speaking? This book of the Torah shall not depart out of your mouth. But you shall meditate in it day and night. It's his Torah we're supposed to be speaking. Now, he's given us a plan to see health restored. Part of it, James talks about in 5.14, is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the assembly and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed sins, he will be forgiven. If that's the reason why the sickness has come on this person, Yeshua told the disciples, whoever sins you remit, they're remitted. We can do this as we're praying over people. And we know it's not a sin unto death. It can be removed, and the Father can bring that healing as we bind together his brethren over this person. And he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses one to another, and pray for one another that you may be healed. This is very important. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. This is part of that obedience that he's talking about. Praying for one another. If we've sinned against a brother, go to that brother and confess your sin. It's not saying confess it to a priest or confess it publicly, but confess it to the person that you've wronged and be reconciled. That you may be healed. Confessing trespasses to one another and praying for one another is part of this plan. And in Ephesians 6, 18, it says, Praying always, with all prayer and supplication, in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Prayer is powerful, and it, it's part of the healing. We need to be praying for one another just like we do when we take our prayer requests. Now, it's all prayer in the Spirit. Matthew 6, 7, Yeshua says, But when you pray, don't use vain repetitions as, as the heathen do, for they think they should be heard from their much speaking. Or if you ever go to a synagogue, they'll give you a prayer book, and you're going to read set prayers out of this prayer book over and over, same thing, every Shabbat. Could that be vain repetition? He's wanting us to pray from the heart. He's wanting us to pray as the Spirit leads. 1 John 5, 14. And this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, Whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions we desired of him. Why? Because we're asking according to his will. Just like Yeshua did nothing unless he got it from the Father. He went to that pool of Bethesda, healed with one guy, and then turned around and left. If we're listening to the voice of the Father in the same manner, and we're praying according to what he's putting on our hearts to pray for, we're going to see it happen every time. It's following his lead. Sometimes it takes prayer and fasting to be able to hear like that. But we have to do whatever it takes. We need to hear his voice. How do we know what his will is? As I said, we'll hear it, but then also Romans 8, 26. And as well as this, the Spirit too comes to help us in our weakness. For when we don't know how to pray properly, then the Spirit personally makes our petitions for us in groans that can't be put into words. This is talking about praying in the Spirit, groaning in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit speaking through us in other tongues. And he who can see into the, all the hearts knows what the Spirit means because the prayers that the Spirit makes for God's holy people are always in accordance with the mind of God. If we're praying in the Spirit, we might not know it with our minds, but we're praying the perfect will of God, and it will come to pass. 
He will always pray the perfect will of God through us. In Jude one twenty, it says, But you, my dear friends, must build yourselves up on the foundation of your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. That's part of it. So what exactly is praying in the Spirit? Well, in 1 Corinthians 14.1, you can read that whole chapter and kind of get more insight on it, but I'm just going to read a little bit for now. He says, Follow after charity or love, and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you may prophesy. For he that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not unto men. Now, this is talking about in the assembly. We don't want to do this in the assembly. He that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not unto men, but unto God. For no man understands him. Howbeit, in the Spirit, he speaks mysteries. But what's he doing? He's speaking the perfect will of God. He's praying that perfect will. Nobody else understands him, and it's not meant to be understood by people. But God understands it. Now, this is what we do in our prayer closet, not in the assembly, unless there's going to be an interpretation. And then there's a special anointing that you'll know there's going to be an interpretation when you do it. Now, praying in the Spirit is praying in other tongues. And as I said, it's not normally done in the assembly. Now, if you don't have the gift of being able to pray in other tongues yet, you can still stir up the Spirit another way. Ephesians 5.18 says, And do not be drunk with wine, whereas in excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Yeshua Messiah, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. So we can stir up that gift. Just like when we're coming together and we're, we're singing together and we feel His presence, we can do that in our own prayer closet, stirring our own selves up. So it's his spirit that brings the healing and the life. In Romans 8, 11, it says, But if the spirit of him that raised up Yeshua from the dead dwells in you, he that raised up Messiah from the dead shall also quicken or give life to your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. Therefore, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh, for if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the spirit do mortify the deeds of your body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And that's the example that Yeshua gave us. He did nothing unless he heard it of the Father. He would get up a great deal before the day and he'd go off and pray. This, these are the things that we have to do. We have to diligently be seeking him. Earnestly desiring the best gifts. It takes work on our part. It doesn't just happen automatically. But we can tap into hearing his, his very own voice and being led by his Spirit, just like Yeshua did. And if Yeshua had to do it, how much more should we? He was the most anointed man to walk the face of the earth. God in the flesh came to set the example of what we're supposed to do. So following the leading of the Spirit and not the flesh is also part of this plan. Each path towards divine healing is unique. And the Master will reveal it to us if we follow Him and His Spirit. That's the thing. You can't use a, a, a set pattern. There's no... Uh, what do they call it? No um, formula that you can follow. You have to get it from him because it's different every time. We've seen a number of different healings, like I said, in our family. And every time he's given us different instructions on how to see that walk through. But we had to be praying about it. We had to seek his face before he would share that with us. It didn't happen automatically. We have to do our part. We have to seek him, diligently seek him. In John 6, 63, Yeshua says it's the spirit that quickens. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And what were the words he was speaking? It was the Torah. He was the Torah made flesh. It was the living word of God that he was speaking. His words are spirit and they are life. And this is why we're to meditate in them day and night. To speak them not letting them depart out of our mouths. If we practice this, our thoughts will be continually on Yahweh also. Constantly meditating on and speaking on this Torah and other promises that apply to your situation, you'll have good success. That's the thing. We have to brainwash ourselves. We have to continually think on the good things. The enemy's going to try to come and discourage you, just like he did with Job and his friends. But we have to choose to hear only the master. Just like in the midst of the storm, keep your eyes on him. You can walk on water. These signs will follow those that believe. In my name, they will cast out devils. 
They'll speak with new tongues. They'll take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it won't hurt them. They'll lay hands on the sick and they will recover. These are promises. Yeshua said these will happen. We can expect them to happen, but we have to do our part by seeking him and being led by his spirit. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you again for this time of coming together as your people Israel, natural branches and grafted in, but one in Messiah Yeshua, the body of Messiah. Father, you've made us a kingdom of priests. Thank you, Father, for the blessing on your people Israel. Yivarechecha Yahweh Vayishmarecha Ya'er Yahweh P'navelecha V'hunecha Yisa Yahweh Panavelecha Vayasim lecha Shalom. May Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May Yahweh lift up his countenance towards you and give you his peace, his shalom. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, we pray. Amen and amen. We are dismissed. Hallelujah.